Has it ever felt like this moment has happened before? We are all vaguely familiar with the concept of deja vu, but could there be something more to this feeling? Something that, once realized, could be so terrifying that it drives one mad? When we are at our lowest point, when we are thoroughly lonely, sad, and beaten down by the world, we eventually cling to hope that we can work our way out of it. With that, we hope that whatever it is that pulls us out of the abyss will keep us from ever having to endure it again. Yet somehow, in different moments, with different people, and in different places, the feeling always returns. Life cracks open like an egg into a piping hot frying pan. We are suddenly made aware of ourselves. We no longer go about our day thinking everything is under control. We pause, take a look around, and are confronted by the collapse of what we thought made us who we are. And the things we thought we liked seem to melt in our hands. This life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once again, and innumerable times again. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unspeakably small or great in your life must return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. In this aphorism, Nietzsche introduces us to a certain thought experiment, where one is visited by a demon, or perhaps an angel, and told that they must live each and every one of their experiences over and over again, that no matter how tragic, one must eternally endure. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned over again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. This early iteration of the eternal return is meant to be shocking, to be terrifying, to prompt us to seriously consider what it would be like to relive each and every decision. For Nietzsche, life is about peaks and valleys, and if one is to embrace life, and will the life they desire into existence, they must understand that the highest mountain peaks are accompanied by the deepest canyons. Something we must be prepared for. So ask yourself, do you live in this way? Do you make decisions that you could endure in eternity? Or would you be condemned to live in regret and mediocrity over and over? In Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in a section called The Vision and the Enigma, Nietzsche's Zarathustra tells of a vision he had while he is traveling on a ship. The vision is filled with intense imagery and unnerving characters, such as a dwarf on his shoulder, whispering words of poisoned lead into Zarathustra's ear and brain, words of doubt, of inevitable return to the valley of despair from the heights that Zarathustra seeks to climb. O oh, Zarathustra, it whispered scornfully, syllable by syllable, you stone of wisdom, you threw yourself high, but every thrown stone must fall. Nietzsche is talking about that voice in all of us, that anxious and cynical voice that emerges when we are at our most vulnerable, when we feel alone in this task of life. Whenever we try to climb out of it, out of depression, out of being hateful, out of being regretful, this voice essentially says, why bother? Because we know we will always end up back at the bottom anyway no matter how high we fly for a time. Look at this gateway, dwarf, I continued. It has two faces. Two roads come together here. These have no one yet gone to the end of. This long lane backwards, it continues for an eternity. And that long lane forward, that is another eternity. And it is here, at this gateway, that they come together. The name of the gateway is inscribed above this moment. What's happening here is our sudden awareness of the present. We spend most of our lives on autopilot, just following the plan. But when things get tough and the plan falls apart, we get stuck, and suddenly become aware of how critical and difficult the present moment is, instead of living in the future or the past. Overwhelmingly happy moments can do this as well, those sudden moments when you stop and take in the individual bits, realizing how special it is. Nietzsche continues. Observe, continued I, this moment from the gateway, this moment. There runs a long eternal lane backwards. Behind us lies an eternity. Must not whatever can run its course of all things have already run along that lane? 
Must not whatever can happen of all things have already happened, resulted, and gone by? And if everything have already existed, what do you think of this moment? Must not this gateway also have already existed? And are not all things closely bound together in such a way that this moment draws all coming things after it? Consequently, itself also? For whatever can run its course of all things, also in this long lane outward must it once more run. In this slow spider which creeps in the moonlight, in this moonlight itself, and you and I in this gateway whispering together, whispering of eternal things. Must we not all have already existed? And must we not return and run in that other lane out before us, that long weird lane? Must we not eternally return? Some take this as a metaphysical claim that such is the nature of time and energy to infinitely return in a cycle of repetition, creation and destruction, death and rebirth, and so on. This is possible, perhaps even likely, as Nietzsche was heavily influenced by ancient Greek notions of being. But we must not lose sight of his primary message, a message for what he believed was a select few readers, one which is about and for human life. Souls are as mortal as bodies, but the plexus of causes returns in which I am intertwined. It will again create me. I myself pertain to the causes of the eternal return. I come again with this sun, with this earth, with this eagle, with this serpent, not a new life or a better life or a similar life. I come again eternally to this identical and self-same life, in its greatest and its smallest, to teach again the eternal return of all things, to speak again the great noontide of earth and man, to announce again to man the overman. Nietzsche struggled horribly in life, being rejected socially, intellectually, and even by his own body, and this pushed him to adopt the concept of amor fati, or love of one's fate. His concept of the ubermensch, or overman, is an ideal to be strived towards, one where we can properly direct a creative potential in this life and the future of humanity as a whole. Perhaps the most initially demoralizing realization from this is the inevitable return to a state of pain from any state that we want to be living in. The will required to then commit to returning to a state of happiness when one is aware of its fleeting nature seems tragic. The indomitable will of humankind seems almost entirely preoccupied with coming to terms with a state of pain and committing to the task of digging oneself out of it. If we were to point to an external scenario in which the same dynamic would play out, we would in all likelihood tell that individual to end such a torturous cycle. If someone were pursuing a career and, after every long period of work, they finally get that job just to be returned to the same beginning point over and over, would we not consider the endeavor ridiculous? We undoubtedly would. So if this is the dynamic of life being played out in the emotionally confused mind of modern people, why is this considered a state of life worth continuing? It is almost as if many of us are stuck in a sickening state of being, which is a loop, always ending up at the beginning when one reaches the end. But if we are to take control, if we are to reach the highest mountain peaks, we must traverse the lowest valleys. The common man for Nietzsche stays in the comfort of plains and small hills, desiring the peaks, but not strong enough to commit to the valleys. The power of suffering, the value of man, are rooted in their inevitability in life. We all want to adopt something that will keep us in the heights of happiness forever. But if we want the best of life, we need to affirm all of life and live it as if we had to relive each and every decision over and over again. I was in darkness, but I took three steps and found myself in paradise. The first step was a good thought, the second a good word, and the third a good deed. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel for more. It helps us immensely. Visit the link in the comments to see how you can become a member of our community and support the channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.